Well, hey, welcome to this digital breakout. I am so glad to be with you. My name is David Smullen. I come to you from Rock Creek Church up in the Dallas, Texas area. Um, I actually have a really unique position there because I'm the student pastor, but I'm also the young adult pastor. So they've just rolled it into next gen pastor, but it's really given me a great look at the next generation. And so we're going to be talking about how we can actually impact and influence the next generation at even a greater level in this breakout. Um, but before I hop into it, uh, I just want to just, can I confide in you? Like, is this a safe spot for me just to open up for a minute? Um, here's the thing, youth ministry, it's really, really hard. And so while most of the time um, I'm looking forward to Wednesday nights, sometimes I just want to skip to Thursday. Most of the times I'm encouraged. Sometimes I'm discouraged. Most of the time I absolutely love my job, love getting to do what I do, but sometimes I dream about being a pizza delivery boy contactless delivery so that I don't have to deal with the parents. Uh, youth ministry, no cap, it's got its challenges, but it is so, so worth it. It's a privilege, it's an honor to get to serve the next generation, but I do know that there are some unique stressors to being in this role that you can commiserate with. I, I think a lot of student pastors are under the gun, mainly because in a lot of cases we're under-resourced, we're overworked, and more often than not, we have a shortage of volunteers. I really want to help try to alleviate one of those pain points, specifically around the topic of volunteers. I don't want you to flounder when it comes to volunteers. And so in this breakout, I want to help you develop a volunteer team. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, it says this, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. And student ministry is a team game. We need people around us so that we can truly influence and impact the ne next generation over the long haul. And so in this breakout, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about how to develop volunteer leaders that win the next generation. Volunteer leaders that win the next generation. Let's talk about that next. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, so much for the power of your word. We thank you for Unleashed Conference and just being able to gather together to learn, to sharpen, and, uh, and get better at what you've called us to do. Uh, God, I think of the passage where you say the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. We can really relate with that on so many levels, I believe. And so, God, I pray that you would help us raise up more workers so that we could actually influence the next generation at a greater level. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm excited to be sharing uh, in this breakout with you. We don't do a lot of things right at Rock Creek, but I do believe that this is one area that we are excelling in our student ministry specifically uh, around developing volunteers that can, again, uh, really win the hearts and the minds of our young people. And everything that I share with you here, it doesn't matter what size church you're in. It doesn't matter if you're leading five kids or 50 kids. Uh, this is 100% transferable regardless of the context that you find yourself in. So as we get started, let me just, let me give you my HSO, my hot spiritual opinion. Uh, it is, in my opinion, uh, as, a, as a student pastor, and I'm assuming that um, you guys do small group ministry. So for us on Wednesdays, we gather for about an hour with a worship experience. Then we break into small groups for about 30 minutes. Maybe you do something similar. Maybe you even do something in a Sunday school model on, on the weekend. Okay, this is my opinion. As the student pastor, you should not be leading a student small group. And I know that that can be really shocking to some because we get into this to impact the kids and we wanna be involved uh, with the kids. But I would actually say that you're gonna have a far greater impact if you spend 80% of your time actually pouring into volunteers that then can pour in to reach other students. 80% of your time, here's why I say that. The most competent leaders, I mean, I think your best small group leaders can probably disciple effectively maybe around 12 people. Uh, you know, depending on the skill set and the individual could be a little bit more, could be a little bit less, but let's just round it off to a dozen. I mean, after all, that sounds biblical. I think there was a dude that had like 12 guys in the Bible that followed him. So we'll go with that. Um, hey, by the way, I actually just thought about this uh, when I was thinking about this breakout. You realize Jesus was actually the first youth pastor ever. Like it's widely assumed every single one of his disciples was a teenager with the exception of Peter. I don't really know what happened with Peter. He might've gotten held back, but anyway, um, that has nothing to do with the topic anyway. So 12, 12, Jesus discipled 12. Um, I think most people can probably handle a dozen. So put that into your context. 
If you can really effectively pour into about 12 individuals, your impact in the ministry is gonna be really, really muted if you go larger than that. But think about the impact that just adding three volunteers can have to your ministry. If you brought in three volunteers to your ministry, now instead of just impacting a dozen students, you could impact well over 30 effectively. In fact, Fuller uh, Youth Institute, they put out a study that said, one of the crucial factors in whether or not a student is gonna stick and stay with Jesus after they graduate actually comes down to one-on-one -on -one mentorship. Did they have at least one meaningful adult pour into their life in middle school and high school? So here's the first thing that you need to grasp about why you need to be thinking team-based ministry and how to do this effectively. Quantity matters. Quantity matters. We actually need more volunteers than a lot of times we think that we need. We need to staff larger, not smaller. Here's what I would actually encourage you to start taking aim at. I would encourage you to go for a five to one ratio. For every five students, make it your goal to have one adult volunteer. Because while the rock star volunteers or the rock star leaders might be able to impact a dozen kids, the average volunteer is probably gonna be more effective at about three to five students. Because think about it, they've got full-time jobs, ministry is just a side thing. They've got a family of their own, they've got all these different irons in the fire, and so I think that they're gonna be more effective on a three to five uh, margin than they would if you gave them you know, well over 12 or sometimes 15, 20 students because you're so understaffed. And so I want you to start thinking five to one ratio and realize that quantity matters. Um, for a little bit of context, at Rock Creek Church, I came into the ministry, we had about 10 volunteers total. As the ministry is scaled, we're now at 35 volunteers that specifically lead small group ministries. That has us at a four to one ratio in our middle school and high school ministries. And then in addition to those volunteers, we actually have other volunteers that are helping uh, run parking flow. They are doing guest check-ins for our student ministries, and then they're helping with setup and teardown. Uh, this has actually become a great bullpen, by the way. We stash a lot of future small group leaders in these ancillary roles until we have openings in the small group level. And so that might be something that you wanna employ in your context. Um, and I know what you're thinking when you hear four to one ratio of what we're running, or maybe even this five to one that I'm trying to challenge you to start taking aim at, you're thinking, man, there is no way I can get there. You're, you're looking at your roster, you've got 60 kids, maybe four volunteers on a good night, and you're like, I have absolutely no way, David, that I can get to that, to that level. So let me just kind of help you with that, because it really comes down to recruiting. It comes down to recruiting. Now on recruiting, it's all about communication. It's all about how you communicate to the potential volunteer. And this is where I see so many people make a mistake. Write this down. Volunteers will not give of their time because of what you need. Volunteers will give of their time because of why they are needed. Okay, I'll say that again. People will not volunteer because of what you need. They'll volunteer because why they are needed. And so you didn't think you were in sales, you thought you were doing youth ministry, but you're kind of bivocational. You got to do both. You got to pitch them. You got to sell them on the reason that they should get involved in the student ministry. A lot of people, they, again, they focus on what they need. And so that sounds something like this. You'll, you'll find somebody that you think might be a good fit and you'll come up to them and you're like, man, we are way understaffed. We don't have enough guys in the, in the, in the, in the youth ministry. I could really use your help. Hey, it's just an hour commitment. Like, can you just give me maybe like one hour a Wednesday, like, if you can even do it three times a month, that would be fantastic. Like maybe, could you possibly, do you have margin? That's how a lot of us go about our recruiting efforts. But this is what it could sound like if you were really focusing on why that person is needed. You could go up to him and say, hey, dude, like, man, as I've gotten to know you, uh, I think you would be really, really dynamic in our student ministry. I think that you would really relate and connect with the kids. I don't know if you've ever even thought about serving in students. Now I may be biased, but... I think this is the best ministry in our church. Um, statistically, 80% of young people start a relationship with Jesus before they graduate high school. Okay, so think about that. If you actually invest your time in the middle school or high school ministries, you could literally help a kid form their faith that lasts a lifetime. All right, hopefully you can tell the difference there between 
you know, coming at them from what you need versus why they are needed. And when you talk about what you need, it can almost sound desperate. It can sound uh, like you're begging. But when you present why this person is needed, it comes across as an opportunity. And that's what people will sign up for, an opportunity to make a difference. Quantity matters. I want you to start thinking about how you can recruit enough volunteers where you have one adult for every five kids for greater impact. How are you going to do it? You're going to focus on recruiting based on why, not on what. Now, let me flip the coin and present a second idea here. Same coin, two sides. This is really the big idea that I want you to capture and take away from this breakout. As we talk about uh, developing a volunteer team to win the next generation, quantity matters, but quality matters most. Quantity matters, but quality matters most. Man, you could hit that five to one ratio that I'm encouraging you to go after. But if you have a bunch of duds, a bunch of C players that really aren't that invested, that aren't really that uh, geared to reach the next generation, you're not going to have a big impact on the students. And in fact, those volunteers may be a greater liability than asset. And so quality matters greatly. This is where you have to be so strategic in how you recruit. You know, a lot of churches, what they do is they broadcast openly, this, this mass broadcast, hey, we need volunteer help. And so they'll post it on social, they'll put it out on the Sunday, uh, you know, stage and, and try to get people that way. Um, I would say that is not the most effective way to get quality volunteers into your ministry. Okay, think about it this way. If a baseball team was trying to find their all-star pitcher, like there is no way that they're going to open up tryouts to the general public. Like that would be crazy. Makes for a great movie. It would be a complete gong show in real life. Like nobody is going to, to do that at the major league level. Instead, what do they do? They strategically hire scouts to go find the top talent. You need to strategically scout out the best volunteers within your ministry. Because here's the problem. If you just broadcast openly, you're going to have a lot of people step up to the plate that think that they are gifted for student ministry. But the best volunteers are going to remain on the bench. Why? Because they know the value of their time and their time is too valuable to respond to a mass invitation. But if you present it right and you come into this as a one-on-one -on -one conversation, a one-on-one -on -one invitation, you're going to get a lot farther with those high capacity volunteers. Now, I want to just give you kind of one side note to think about. Even if you have scouted the best of the best and you're sure that this person would be phenomenal in student ministry, I want to encourage you to put them through a formal sit-down interview process. You know, at the major league level, you got scouts. The scouts don't determine who makes the team. They just determine who gets the invite to training camp. It's that same sort of philosophy. So within our ministry, I actually have a team of student directors. I have middle school and high school directors. These are all volunteers, by the way. They are not paid. I'm the only paid uh, staff person within youth ministry at Rock Creek. So I've got this volunteer team that kind of leads a lot of, of what we do from an operational standpoint. And I have trusted them with the ability to um, really field these interviews. Um, and so I trust them. They know what we're looking for. They know what a, a successful volunteer looks like. And so whether I scout somebody out or somebody else uh, within our ministry says, hey, this person could be a good fit. We put them through that interview process. And I'll just share with you real quick the three things that we're really evaluating when we have this sit down one-on-one -on -one conversation. We're looking for character, connectivity, and we're looking for compatibility. Okay, let's start with character. Uh, character is so, so important. Um, we're looking to see, hey, is this person humble? Do they have some sort of hidden agenda? Are they really in it for the kids or are they trying to get something out of it on their own end? Uh, maybe most importantly, what's their faith like? Do they have a authentic relationship with Jesus? Because we believe that they can't pour out what's not already in them. So a question to filter uh, your decisions through when you're evaluating somebody's character, because sometimes it's hard to really look at the heart, but you've got to go with this gut qu check question. Um, would you allow this person to mentor your child? Would you allow this person, if they were the only person pouring into your child spiritually, would you be okay with that? 
And if you're not a parent yet, try to put on your parent cap. And if you're not a parent, you can't put on the parent cap and that's just hard for you, then think about it through this lens. Would you take advice from this person? And if the answer is no, then don't bring them into your ministry, all right? You gotta look at character. Number two, you gotta look at connectivity. This is all about their ability to relate with students because let's be real, there's gonna be some people that just their personalities vibe well with the kids and leadership is influence. And so if they can't really relate and connect on a personal level, they're not gonna be successful in the student ministry. Uh, there's not a golden age to this, by the way. I mean, we've got people in our ministry that are young adults, so in, in their college years that have invested down their time. And then we have parents in the ministry that have kids that are in middle school and they're serving the high schoolers and they do a phenomenal job. So there's not a right or wrong age, but I will tell you this, if a grandpa came in with a cane and like a colonoscopy bag hanging out of his pants, he's probably not gonna connect. And so you've just gotta kind of feel this out, who's gonna connect best with your students. And then lastly, um, what about uh, compatibility? Okay, again, if we're talking about developing a volunteer team to win the next generation, they need to be compatible with you and they need to be compatible with the rest of the team. And so you gotta look, do these, does this person, uh, will they play nice with others? Will they connect with our team? Are they gonna be a valuable addition or are they gonna take away from what we already have from a chemistry standpoint? Um, for us, we have four values in our ministry. Uh, hero servants is what we're looking for. People that have the ability and willingness to be extreme owners. owners. So we want people that will take uh, ownership of their small group and really be the pastor and be the shepherd. Uh, we value relationship building. And so do they have the time to pour into students? And then again, one team. I'm really big on this team concept. And so are they gonna be unified with the rest of the team? And so we're evaluating through those values. Uh, maybe for you, uh, you have a value of encouragement. You wanna be the voice that encourages students in a world that says that they can't. Okay, great, that's an awesome value. So what you need to, to unearth is, is this person a natural encourager? You know, if you start to get to know them and in the interview, like you find out their second language is pessimism, they're probably not gonna be compatible with your ministry. Quantity matters, quality matters most. You gotta find really quality uh, volunteers that are willing to invest their time. A couple of years ago, we were going through this interview process with this older gentleman. He was a former teacher um, and he came in wanting to serve in the student ministry. And so uh, my team was actually unsure on him. They gave him a yellow light. So this is the only point in which I actually get involved in the process. If my team gives somebody a red light, I trust my team. If they give them a green light, I trust my team. But if it's a yellow light, I'll kind of come in, be the voice of reason and give that final vote. So I come in, I have this conversation just on the side, just me and this individual and the topic of masks came up because we were just coming um, out of like kind of the, the, the first wave of COVID. And so we had reopened as a church um, and he was asking if we were gonna require masks to which I said, yes, we're gonna require masks. The school system's requiring masks. We're trying to keep consistency with the schools. And I said, beyond that, like I also had a little bit of an underlying health issue at the time. And so I was personally thinking that this was the best option a, a, a across the board. And, and man, the guy just like started to lose it. He came unglued. And it was like, I don't know if I wanna serve then. He's like, I think that's being coward. I think that's bowing down to the government. And again, I'm not here to make a political statement. I'm just here to tell how this story went. And so I, this was an emotionally charged conversation and knowing that you know, it was emotional for both of us, I, I said, hey, let's just kind of step back on this. I don't think I'm gonna be bending on this max policy, but give me a week, let me think about it. I want you to pray about it. I'll get back with you and we'll see if this is a, a mutually good fit for you to come into the ministry. And so I step away from that conversation and the more I started to think about it, the more it just really bothered me. I knew that this guy would connect with the kids, but I was starting to have serious character questions and compatibility questions. Um, compatibility, I, I, I knew he did not like this mask mandate. And so I didn't think that if I went this direction, he would really be able to roll up under my leadership. And there might be uh, an attempt to undermine what we were trying to do and what I was trying to instill with our team. But this also raised greater character issues in my mind as well, because I had a ton of volunteers that had no desire to wear a mask. Nobody likes putting that itchy mask on their face, but they were willing to set aside their comfort to help some students meet and follow Jesus. And so as I started to think about this, I realized that this was more of a character heart check for this guy. And so when I called him back a week later, I didn't even give him the option. I said, hey, as I've started to evaluate this, we're gonna stick with this mask policy and I just don't think that this is gonna be a good fit. I don't think that you're gonna be compatible and be able to embrace what we need you to embrace to help these students meet and follow Jesus. 
well, that was a hard conversation. But I'm going to save you a thousand headaches. It's way easier to have that conversation up front than it is to try to remove somebody that's already been serving in the ministry. And so, man, if you can't give them a green light with confidence, don't go forward with it. This was hard uh, to have the conversation with this gentleman, but it was even harder because we really needed guys at this point in our ministry. We were desperate. We were recruiting on, on why you should come serve, but man, we were desperate. We had three guys I was one of them. And so we really needed a guy to serve in this ministry, but I just knew that this was not the right fit for the ministry at the time. And so we said no to this gentleman. And God actually honored that. Within two months, we actually had more men serving than what we needed. Because again, we held to our guns and knew that quality mattered most. Quantity matters. Go for that one to five ratio, but understand quality matters most. Now I'll just add on kind of just a little bit of bonus content in about 30 seconds here real quick. Because again, if you're, if you're wanting to develop a volunteer team to win the hearts and the minds of the next generation, you got to have the numbers, you got to have the quality, but you also have to have clear expectations. Uh, you have to define what a win looks like for your team. Uh, imagine this, if you were trying to recruit a bunch of people in your neighborhood to, to form a flag football team, and you went to all the people that you thought looked like the best athletes, and so you go out there on your first game day and you hand the ball off to this dude. And then he takes the ball, puts it on the ground. He starts kicking it around uh, like a soccer ball. And you're like, what are you doing? And you realize that this guy is actually from Europe. So when you said football, he had in mind American soccer because uh, soccer and football are the same. And you're like, man, why are you kicking this? And he's laughing at you because you brought this weird shaped ball to a soccer game. <laughs> That's what it's like when you don't have clear expectations at the student ministry level. You've gotta be on the same page. You gotta give them the right playbook. And so I would encourage you uh, to think through the expectations that you have for your volunteers. I'd put it into writing because if it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. Um, so just think through, through things. What's the time commitment? Uh, what are some practical helps and tips that you can give them to be successful in leading a small group? Uh, what's your reporting policy? If a student came up to them and say, hey, I, you know, I'm suicidal, how do you want them to handle that? These are things that you need to be clear about up front. So get it into a handbook, put it in writing. Uh, if you want just a good reference or starting point, we've got this. I would be happy to resource you with it. Uh, you can email me, david at rockcreektx.church. So it's my first name, david at rockcreektx.church, and I'll get that on over to you. So as we wrap up this conversation real quick, I just want to leave you just with kind of one thought of encouragement. Um, I actually, before I became a student pastor, I got a late start in my, in my mid thirties at this. Um, and so I spent 12 years in advertising sales and having worked in advertising sales, here's what I can tell you. Uh, companies are investing a lot of time, a lot of energy and a lot of money to reach the next generation. Why? They know if they can reach somebody now, they can have a consumer for life. I've literally seen companies spend billions of dollars to reach the next generation. So think about that. If companies are spending just billions of dollars to reach one individual in Gen Z, how much more is the devil investing? See, we're not just trying to develop a team for a friendly game of cricket. We are in a spiritual war that we are trying to win. And the enemy is waging war against Generation Z. And we've got to get a team that is willing to step up and fight back. This is a war, by the way, that we may be behind in. Uh, there was a study, 70%, 70% of the students that we're serving right now in our ministry will fall away after they graduate. Okay, that's what this picture looks like. 70% percent will fall away. And I thought you were like, hey, you're going to encourage me at the end. Check, please. Okay, hold on a second. That's the narrative. 70% will fall away unless we pull in one person that can make a personal one-on-one -on -one connection and mentor these kids through middle school and high school. We literally have the ability to flip the scoreboard. One person can actually cut that number in half and help more people stick and stay with Jesus. So we need more volunteers. We need volunteers that we can uh, develop one-on-one -on -one connections with the kids. And we need quality volunteers as well. Because if we are going to win the hearts and the minds of the next generation, 
We've got to have the numbers and we've got to have the quality. And so that's why this is so, so important to develop a volunteer team so that we can keep their hearts and minds captured beyond high school.